Hi, this is your Russian Rulers podcast host, Mark Schaus. I'm interrupting today's podcast all the way from episode 108 to make a short announcement. I've created a new blog site for all things having to do with Russian history and far beyond just the rulers. You can find it at www.russianrulershistory.com. I mean, there's a lot of content there already to read about things like the Decemberist Revolt of 1825, the life of Sviatopolk the Accursed, Nikita Khrushchev, and much, much more. Of course, there's also a small little PayPal donation button there if you want to help support the podcast. It would be much appreciated. Now, on to the podcast. Welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 84, Wehrmacht on the Run. Last time, we recounted the battles of Moscow and Stalingrad, along with the Siege of Leningrad. The German forces faced their first defeats and were gradually being pushed back by the Red Army, with both suffering horrific losses. During the early part of the German invasion, Stalin pleaded with Sir Winston Churchill to open a second front to take some of the pressure off the Russians. He sent Molotov to England, good old stone arse, to plead his case, but to no avail. Churchill would like nothing better than to let Stalin and Hitler beat each other to death. Two quotes sum up Churchill's feelings. The first is that, quote, grim Bolshevik state, which I once tried hard to suffocate at birth, and which, until the emergence of Hitler, I regarded as the worst enemy of civilized freedom. The second, if Hitler occupies hell, I will ask the House of Commons for aid for the devil. Churchill would not be the first, nor the last person, to equate the boss with the devil. On November 7, 1941, a new ally joined with the USSR, the United States, after the attack on Pearl Harbor. It was this attack that woke the sleeping giant. It also meant that the Japanese had to focus east toward the oncoming U.S. and not north and west towards the USSR. This was important, as you recall, from last episode, when the Russians were able to peel off 53 divisions of troops for the Battle of Stalingrad and Moscow, as they felt the threat from the Japanese had evaporated. Maxim Litvinov, the once disgraced Bolshevik, was sent to the United States as the ambassador. One reason was the fact that he was Jewish, and that would help mend the bad public opinion that came about during the Great Purges. Litvinov was able to get the U.S. to agree to supply the USSR with aluminum, weapons, and, of course, much-needed food. Now, what many have said about this aid, and Churchill's reluctance to start a second front, is that it gave Stalin precious time to become one of the biggest military powers in world history. The boss was now planning on how he was to create a post-war Europe that would become Bolshevized, just as he had planned in the early 1930s. But now he had to play the game next to two of the big boys of the world, Churchill and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The big three, as they were called, first met in Tehran on November 28th to December 1st, 1943. They had planned to meet in Cairo on November 22nd through the 26th, but because Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek of the Republic of China attended, Stalin refused to come as he was backing his future, future protege, Mao Zedong, and the Chinese communists. Before the conference, there were also tensions between the U.S. and Great Britain over the renewal of the British Empire after the war and the opening of a second front. By now, numerous telegrams had been sent back and forth between the three men, but now was the time they needed to meet in person. Roosevelt's health was by now deteriorating, so the 7,000-mile trip was arduous, whereas Stalin had a much shorter trip. Churchill relished traveling, as he was already, you know, had been to Moscow and the U.S. twice each. Stalin met Roosevelt first, who was by now in a wheelchair. Churchill followed soon thereafter. Stalin purposely held the meeting where he did, closer to Moscow, so he could better control the situation. 
the Tehran conference was essentially a meeting to coordinate the war effort and get full cooperation from the Soviet Union in their war with Nazi Germany. Stalin demanded a free hand in Poland and that the Allies support the partisans in Yugoslavia, a move that no doubt frightened and helped my partisan mother. A demand of all three men was that Turkey be persuaded to join the Allies in 1944 with Soviet support. Stalin was the dominant force of Tehran, partly due to being close to his capital, partly due to the illness befalling Roosevelt, but mainly because of his army's crushing defeat of the Germans at the Battle of Kursk in July and August of 1943. This battle, the largest armored fight of all time, convinced Stalin that the Soviet army could stand up to anyone, including the United States. Now, the Battle of Kursk was an attempt by the Germans to break the Kursk salient, which had occurred after the loss at Stalingrad. Without going into details, because I will cover this battle with its own podcast or podcast series after we finish with Putin, it was a pincer movement planned by Berlin to surround and cut off the Red Army and circle it and destroy it. Needless to say, it failed and hastened the end of Nazi Germany. During the tripartite dinner of November 29th, Churchill presented Stalin with the, the Sword of Stalingrad, which was made in Sheffield, England, to commemorate the victory at Stalingrad. After kissing the scabbard, Stalin handed it to the obviously tipsy Voroshilov, who comically proceeded to drop it. Well, the upshot of the Tehran conference was the following. One, the Yugoslavians should be aided with supplies and equipment, and also by commando operations. Two, Turkey should be persuaded to come into the war on the side of the Allies before the year's end. Now, if Turkey found itself at war with Germany, and as a result Bulgaria declared war on Turkey or attacked her, the Soviet Union would immediately be at war with Bulgaria. And number three, Operation Overlord is to be launched in May of 1944 with an operation against southern France occurring at the same time. Stalin also assured the other two leaders that the Soviets would launch an offensive at the same time to prevent the Germans from transferring forces from the eastern to the western front. And four, they all agreed to work together militarily through their staffs. This last part was to continue to the end of the war, but deteriorate rapidly as the Germans began their surrender. Returning to Konsevo after the conference, Stalin demanded to be filled in twice a day by his Stavka generals. He was a complete, hands-on micromanager of the war effort, so when Vasilevsky in Stalingrad once failed to do so, Stalin wrote him the following telegram, quote, It's already 3.30, and you have not deemed to report. You cannot use the excuse that you have no time, as Zhukov is doing just as much at the front as you, yet he sends his report every day. The difference between you and Zhukov is that he is disciplined, whereas you lack discipline. I am warning you for the last time that if you allow yourself to forget your duty once more, you will be removed as Chief of General Staff and sent to the front. It was toward the end of the Battle of Stalingrad that the boss began to make notice of one of his subordinates, one Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev. Early on in the battle, he performed poorly, acting scared. But as the battle progressed, Stalin became very impressed by his organizational skills. But had he seen into the future and heard a speech denouncing Stalin in 1956 made by his governor of the Ukraine, it is no doubt that Khrushchev would have been quickly shot. In researching Stalin, I came upon a, a great passage on how his subordinates would, would gauge the boss's mood, which was critical if he wanted to stay alive. It went something like this. Quote, Stalin was always pacing up and down. There were various warning signals of a black temper. If the pipe was unlit, it was a bad omen. If Stalin put it down, an explosion was imminent. Yet, 
if he stroked his mustache with the mouthpiece of the pipe. This meant he was pleased. The pipe was both a prop and a weather vane. His tempers were terrifying. He virtually changed before one's eyes, wrote Zhukov, turning pale, a bitter expression in his eyes, his gaze heavy and spiteful. Lavrentia Beria was one of the men responsible to make sure that the slave labor to aid the war movement was available. 300,000 slaves were used to dig the anti-tank trenches around Kursk. The gulags had 1.7 million slaves, and Beria used them until they broke or died, building weapons and material needed for the war effort. It is estimated that around 930,000 of them would die helping win the war, something Beria and his boss Stalin could have cared less about. The other Soviet magnates despised the terror of the party, but they kept that hatred to themselves. But the man they all feared above all was still Stalin. He would issue order after order, always adding a veiled threat or not so veiled threat if they failed. His work hours were staggering, considering he was in his mid-sixties by now, averaging sixteen hours a day, and he demanded his magnates to follow suit. Also, as opposed to his earlier years, he demanded they remain sober, of course, forgiving Voroshilov. Failure to abide by his rules was usually fatal, so they obeyed the boss. While the war was raging, Stalin began to hear stories about the debauched life his son Vasily was leading, which greatly disturbed him as his other son, Yakov, was in a German prisoner of war camp. After Yakov was captured, Vasily was forbidden to fly combat missions. Because of this, he became a constant drunk and womanizer, having affairs with various married women, even though he was married and had a young son. His affair with Nina Carmen was the last straw for the boss. After receiving a letter from Nina's husband, Roman, informing Stalin of the affair, the boss ordered the NKV to check up on his two children. What ensued shattered the already shaky Stalin family relationship. It seems that not only was all the sordid details about Vasily's life true, but 16-year-old Svetlana was dating the much older Alexei Kepler, a famous screenwriter and womanizer as well. Stalin flew into a rage. As Montefiore writes in his book, Stalin, the Court of the Red Tsar, Stalin went into Svetlana's room one day and had the following conversation with his daughter. Where? Where are they all? He spluttered. Where are all these letters from your writer? I know the whole story. I've got all your telephone conversations right here. He tapped his tunic pocket. All right, hand them over. Your Kapler's a British spy. He's under arrest. Svetlana surrendered Kapler's letters and screenplays, but he sh she shouted, But I love him. Love, shrieked Stalin, with hatred of the very word, and for the first time in my life slapped her twice across the face. Then he turned to the nanny. Just think, nurse, how low she's sunk. Such a war going on, and she's busy screwing. No, 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 the nanny tried to explain, fat hands flapping. What do you mean, no, when I know the whole story? Then to Svetlana, take a look at yourself. Who'd want you, you fool? He's got women all around him. Stalin gathered up the letters and took them into the dining room, where he sat at the table where Churchill had dined, and, ignoring the war altogether, started to read them. He did not appear at the little corner that day. That afternoon, when Svetlana returned from school, Stalin was waiting for her in the dining room, tearing up Kepler's letters and photographs. Writer? he sneered. He can't even write decent Russian! She couldn't even find herself Russian. Kepler's Jewishness especially riled him. She left the room, and they did not speak again for many months. Their loving relationship 
was shattered forever. Kepler, for, her, for his part, was sent to an internment camp, a gulag, for five years. Luckily for him, though, he wasn't shot. He would serve a second five-year term, but after Stalin's death he was released. He would have a real affair with Svetlana many years later. Now, back to the war. Russian and Soviet historians call this war the Great Patriotic War and divide it into three sections. The first period goes from June 22, 1941, when Ar Operation Barbarossa began, to November 18, 1942, when Operation Uranus was launched by the Red Army. The second period started on November 19, 1942, and ended on December 31, 1943, when the Soviets began pushing the entire German line backwards. The third period began on January 1, 1944, and ended on May 9, 1945, when the Wehrmacht surrendered and Nazi Germany capitulated. It is at this last period that we now found ourselves. Now, you may want to go over the battles and maneuvers that went on during the war, but I'm not inclined to go there with this podcast today. We're really focused on Stalin, as this is the Russian Rulers History Podcast. I will cover these periods and the battles and maneuvers much more in depth when we transition the podcast to a more of a broader Russian history podcast when we're done with Putin. Stalin had noticed something was changing in the USSR, and that was a movement he could not tolerate, nationalism. He knew the war was coming to an end, and with the Soviets being victorious as Germany was also now fighting a two-front war with the Allies, led by Great Britain and the United States, pushing from the West, and the Red Army pushing from the East. It was now only a matter of months before the game would come to an end. Nationalistic fervor, which Stalin needed to drum up amongst the Ukrainians, the Chechens, the Tatars, the Azerbaijanis, and others at the beginning of the war, when there was a level of uncertainty, was one thing. But now that the war was almost over, the boss could no longer tolerate it in his country, the Soviet Union. One group that was targeted were the Balkars, who lived in the Caucasus. They were not treated very poorly by the occupying Germans in 1941 through 43, so Stalin viewed this as treason. Beria wrote to Stalin, quote, The Balkars gave a friendly welcome to the German occupation of the Caucasus. As they retreated before the blows of the Red Army, the Germans organized Balkar detachments. A few months later, he reported to Stalin, 37,103 Balkars have been loaded into special trains and dispatched to their new areas of settlement in the Kazakh and Kyrgyz republics. There were no incidents requiring attention during the operation. Another purge was going on, yet another terrible loss of life and displacement of whole peoples like the Chechens, whose deep hatred of the Russians can be seen today because of incidents like this one, also reported by Beria. The evictions of the Chechens in Ingush is proceeding normally. 342,647 people were loaded onto special trains on February 25th, and by February 29, the number had risen to 478,479, of whom 91,250 were Ingush, and 387,229 Chechens. The operation proceeded in an organized fashion with no serious instances of resistance or other incidents. There were only isolated cases of attempted flight. Beria was right. Only a few incidents occurred, mostly met with lethal force. The people all too well remembered the Great Purge of 1937 to 1939. They knew they had to comply or else. There were all kinds of people being dispersed throughout Stalin's Soviet Union, but one group he knew he had to put down amid their growing nationalism, and those were the Jews. The boss set them up as he was so wont to do. 
Most of the prominent Jews belong to the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. People like Mikols, Lena Stern, and Lozovsky, with the patron of the committee, none other than Molotov's wife, Paulina Zemchujina. Lozovsky wrote his letter to Stalin, asking to have permission to set up a Jewish socialist state in the Crimea after the Tatars had been relocated. Stalin most assuredly had given approval for the letter to be written and the request made. He was setting them all up for a purge, and they didn't even know it. There were other problems throughout the Soviet Union. Gangs were cropping up throughout all the major cities of the USSR, many populated by ex-army veterans who had suffered the scars of war. They were no longer scared of Stalin or the NKVD. They had seen the horrors of war, and they lacked the ability to be frightened anymore. The boss was being kept up to date by Beria of letters written by men at the front, and, now had, and how they had seen what the West had to offer. And they began to think about independence, democracy, and capitalistic rewards. Stalin could not have this in his perfect Soviet state. Alexander I and the subsequent czars realized the problems they faced after the Russian army defeated Napoleon some 130 years before. The men had seen the other side and began to yearn for more. Then another problem that needed tending to. Red Army soldiers were being liberated from prisoner of war camps as the Soviet troops swept into Germany. Any of the poor men who suffered the horrific conditions of the German camps thought life would be sweeter when they saw their comrades open the gates. But they were sorely mistaken. As Marshal Zhukov said in a plenary meeting of the Central Committee in 1957, after Stalin's death, quote, 126,000 officers who returned from captivity were stripped of their rank and sent to camps. The men were not liberated. They just switched which prisoner camp they went to, from the Germans to the even worse Russian camps. Join me next episode when we bring the big three leaders together at the Yalta Conference, where controversial decisions are to be made that would greatly affect the world, especially Europe, for decades to come. We'll also wrap up World War II and see the beginning of the Cold War between the U.S. and the USSR. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. I'm going to be suspending the special focus segment for a while as I want to wrap up Stalin over the next few podcasts and move on to Khrushchev and Brezhnev. I also hope you heard a little difference in the recording quality today Thanks to listener Michael C., who recommended that I get a pop filter to reduce any popping sounds. He gave me the suggestion at our Facebook site, Russian Rulers History Podcast, where you can ask a question, leave a comment, or make a suggestion. Also, please don't forget to give me a rating on iTunes so this podcast can move up the rankings. I'd also like to thank all of you for making this podcast so popular as it just went over 700,000 downloads last week. Way over what I had ever dreamed of when I started this a little over two years ago. So, as always, Das Vidanya, Ispasiba Bolshoya.